Ancestry is complex in the United States, more so than in most other countries. Today, 97% of Americans are predominantly descended from people who lived outside the country's modern borders, testament as much, if not more so, to the mass genocide and disease inflicted on the continent's native population by colonial America, as to the later waves of immigrants that would expand the country's population rapidly. While the means in which the ancestors of most Americans arrived in the U.S. can be roughly classified into four groups, the native people originally from there whose lands were conquered, people who arrived as colonists, those forcibly brought over in slavery, and those who immigrated to the country, each of these groups are incredibly diverse in their origins, traditions, and cultures, histories, and experiences in the country. On top of that, most Americans today are descendants of usually at least two, but often three or all four of these groups. The largest ethnic group in the country only comprises 13% of the population, and there are around a dozen different ethnic groups representing at least 5 million people. It's estimated that as many as 430 different languages are spoken within the country's borders. Additionally, for those whose families have been in the country for at least a few generations, it's incredibly rare to trace your ancestry to a single country or ethnic group. Most Americans you'll meet are descended from people who spoke a number of different languages, practiced different faiths and traditions, and called different countries home. Despite these vast differences, the many ethnic groups in the U.S. often are concentrated somewhat regionally, which has contributed in part to the country's different regional cultures. In this video, I'm going to explore the ancestry of the United States using maps, some which I created and others that I did not. I'll also take a look at a few of the country's different ethnic groups and go into their histories within the country and the regions where they're most prevalent. I've talked about the ancestry of the US briefly in one of my map videos, but this video is going to go much more in depth. Hello and welcome to That Is Interesting. I'm your host, Carter. Today, the ancestry of the United States, explored through maps. The maps in this style, like the ones I used in the thumbnail, are the ones that I created. This map, which I'm basically basing the video off of, shows the two largest ancestry groups in each state. It's based on self-identification as reported to the census, and I found the data on a site called Roots Beyond Race, made by American Public Media. This is, in my opinion, the best site I know of that aggregates information on the ancestry of the US based on ethnicity, and I definitely recommend checking it out. I make frequent use of it when I'm doing research for my series on each of the states, the US Explained. There are some aspects of it that could be improved. For example, I wish I had information on the US territories, but overall, it's really detailed as well as user-friendly. Basically, it has two main functions. First, you can select from the 200 or so different ethnic groups they have listed, and it maps out the states in which Americans with that ancestry are the most prevalent. You can toggle between sheer numbers and percentages of the population, and it also ranks the states by these stats as well. For example, we can see that Texas has more Kenyan Americans than any other state, but they make up the largest percentage of a state's population in Delaware. On top of that, and this is mostly what I use the site for when I'm writing the US Explained, you can select a specific state as well as DC or the US overall and see the breakdown and ancestry of that specific place. You can see some pretty interesting population and historical trends if you compare these state to state breakdowns to one another, which I did with this map. While there are plenty of maps out there that show the largest ancestry groups in the US by state, I wanted to make one that simultaneously depicts the two largest in each state to better display the nuances of population and ancestry by region. After all, while I'll be focusing a lot on regional and state-by-state -state differences in ancestry in this video, it's important to remember that everywhere you go in the US, you can find people descended from all over the globe. Many of the country's largest ancestry groups, such as, for example, Polish Americans, don't show up on this map because there aren't any states in which they're one of the two largest ancestry groups. Instead, they're spread across a number of different states in smaller but still significant numbers. Each state has two colors. The thicker lines depict the largest ethnic group in that state, the thinner lines the second largest. So you can see how large, often contiguous swaths of the country are grouped together by the largest group, while further subregions often have the same second largest group. German Americans make up the largest ethnic group in the country. About 13% of Americans have German ancestry. States where German is the most common ancestry group are marked in shades of red, and there are 20 in total, all in the northern half of the country stretching from Pennsylvania in a nearly unbroken swath all the way to the Pacific Northwest. Adding states where German Americans are the second largest group gives an additional 11 from Florida to Alaska to California. Germans have been moving to the US since the country's foundation. In other parts of Europe like Britain, France, and Spain, those fleeing poverty, persecution, or social unrest 
often had the option of trying their luck across the Atlantic in their country's settler colonies in the Americas. Germany at the time, though, had no colonies, but Germans had plenty of reasons to leave. Though taking up a significantly smaller land area, Germany had a larger population in the U.S. all the way up until 1870, often with two or three times as many people. At the same time, it was split into dozens of countries, mostly very small, often city-states, inhabited by people who spoke often highly differing dialects of German with different regional cultures who were part of a number of different religious denominations. With a number of conflicts in Europe and no American colonies, Germans began establishing communities in the British colonies instead. After the Thirty Years' War, fought in part on religious grounds between the various Catholic and Protestant states of Germany, many Germans were seeking freedom from religious persecution. One of Britain's North American colonies appealed in particular to religious freedom. William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, was a member of the Quaker faith, a religious minority in England, and was acutely aware of religious persecution. He'd been locked in the Tower of London for his religious views. Penn founded Pennsylvania as a place where Quakers and members of any faith could practice freely, so it strongly appealed to the Germans who were fleeing Europe because of religious persecution. Germans began flocking to the colony, and after a series of crop failures in the Pfalz or Palatinate, a region in what is today Western Germany, German settlement increased even more, primarily to Pennsylvania. By the time the Revolutionary War began, a third of Pennsylvania was German, and German communities were forming in other states as well, such as the Moravians in North Carolina. Pennsylvania Germans, which began to develop a distinct dialect of the language, began spreading south in the Maryland as well as the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. All in all, about a tenth of the new country's population, though formed from British colonies, was German at the time of independence. For a while, they maintained much of their culture and society. Entire towns and religious congregations would uproot and move to the U.S. together, and even today, some members of religious communities like the Amish and Mennonites often speak German, the dialects having since diverged significantly from the German spoken in Europe. But it was in the mid-1800s that immigration from Germany would begin to skyrocket. In 1848, democratic revolutions were spreading across the numerous small German countries, but the revolutions were quashed and the German elites cracked down on those who'd supported them, many of whom fled to the US. Over the next few decades, Germans would continue to leave for America, which was rapidly industrializing and expanding its control westward, and they encouraged their families to join them. In the following decades, millions of German immigrants poured into the country in an enormous migration wave. While many immigrant groups typically settled around the ports of entry they'd arrived in, German immigrants fleeing political and religious persecution more often than economic conditions typically had some money saved up to buy land when they arrived. Many had been farmers back in Germany, and as they were arriving in an era when American settlement was spreading westward, they took advantage of cheap, often free, farmland becoming available in what is now the Midwestern U.S., and later prairie and mountain states like the Dakotas and Montana arriving in northeastern port cities and immediately heading west. Because of this, most of the rural parts of the Midwestern and Northwestern U.S. have high populations of Americans with German ancestry, as do cities like Cincinnati, St. Louis, Milwaukee, and the Twin Cities of Minnesota. The German language remained fairly common in the U.S. for a while, and German language newspapers could be found across the country. The German language, however, eventually faded in popularity in the country. Despite the fact that more Americans today can trace their ancestry to Germany than to England, German is today spoken by less than 1% of Americans, while English remains the dominant language. As Germans, along with other immigrant groups, arrived in the U.S., they settled in a country where English was always the most common language, due to the country's colonial history. Many German immigrants also married into English-speaking families that were already in the country or were recent immigrants as well. After the larger immigration waves, later generations of German Americans didn't pick up the language and grew up speaking English instead. Many also anglicized their surnames upon arrival. Both these trends increased significantly after World War I and continued after World War II. With the U.S. at war with Germany, anti-German sentiment was rampant during World War I, and many German Americans were targets of persecution. German language schools and newspapers shut down, street and town names were changed, and German Americans often stopped speaking the language altogether and even changed their last names, erasing elements of their heritage for fear of persecution, a sad and often forgotten moment in American history. 12% of Americans trace their ancestry at least in part to Mexico. Mexican Americans make up the largest ancestry group in much of the southwestern U.S., in states such as California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas,
all of which were once part of Mexico and not far from the country's border, have been major destinations for immigrants from the country. Mexican Americans make up the second most common ancestry group in another western state, Colorado, as well as Illinois, with the greater Chicago area having a pretty large Mexican community. Most states have a fairly sizable Mexican American population, but Americans with Mexican ancestry are most prevalent in the western, especially southwestern US. Other western and Great Plains states that don't show up on this map but have sizable Mexican American populations include Washington, Oregon, Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Nebraska. Mexico is not a homogenous country. As with the US, it's a North American country that's been shaped heavily by colonialism, immigration, and the country's indigenous people. Though considered a single ethnic group in the census self-identification that Roots Beyond Race uses, Mexicans, like Americans, trace their ancestry to a number of different places. The country has a sizable black population, many indigenous cultures have survived colonialism, 8.3 million Mexicans, for example, speak an indigenous language, 23 times as many as in the United States, and a significant number of people are almost entirely of Spanish descent. Just as in the US, different regions were often influenced by different cultures. The majority of the population though, as well as most Mexican Americans, consider themselves mestizo, people who trace their ancestry back to both Spanish colonists and the indigenous people of the region, such as the powerful Mayan and Aztec empires. Spanish colonialism had a major impact on what would become the United States. Florida and Louisiana, for example, were both at one point Spanish colonies. But as the US continued to push west, it started to come close to New Spain, the country's massive North American possession, which stretched from Northern California to Costa Rica. In 1829, Mexico, which encompassed most of the North and Central mainland part of the Spanish colony, became independent, and soon, the two North American countries came head to head. American settlers had been moving into the Mexican region of Tejas, which they called Texas, eventually fighting a revolution and declaring it an independent republic. Mexico didn't recognize Texan independence, and when the US and Texas made a deal on annexation a few years later, they saw it as an invasion of a disputed territory. War broke out, the US won, and the terms of the treaty gave them former parts of Mexico from Texas to California, much of the modern western US. Upon the end of the war, over 100,000 Mexican citizens living in the conquered northern provinces became American citizens, the first major Mexican population living in the United States. Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Jose, Sacramento, San Diego, Tucson, Albuquerque, Las Vegas, El Paso, San Antonio, so many western and southwestern cities in the US have Spanish names because they were founded or named by Spain or Mexico. The same is true with the states of California, New Mexico, Nevada, and Colorado. The culture of the Southwest has long been influenced by its Spanish and later Mexican history. Most Mexican Americans, however, are descendants of people who immigrated to the US since the 1930s. During World War II, many American farmers left the fight overseas, and the US implemented what was known as the Bracero Program, bringing in Mexican immigrants to temporarily work open agricultural jobs in nearby states like California and Texas. When American farmers returned from the war though, very few returned to farm work. The Bracero Program had been popular and jobs in the US needed to be filled. At the same time, Mexico has faced high problems with poverty both then and now. Though it has a huge economy, for much of its history, business and landowners have made most of the money, while rural areas have struggled with high poverty. Though the country's made major improvements in lowering its poverty rate, it's still very high and economic factors, as well as related factors like violence and crime, have driven many people to immigrate throughout the last century. As immigrants typically left for economic reasons, many had little money and few options besides low-wage work when they arrived. Many followed in the footsteps of the Bracero program and took difficult, often exploitative jobs in farm labor. Unfortunately, like many immigrant groups throughout American history, many immigrants from Mexico have dealt with discrimination. Activists like Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez helped improve the rights of immigrant farm workers in founding a union called the United Farm Workers. As many immigrants worked in agriculture, they often moved to rural parts of the Southwest, where many of their descendants live today. However, practically every major city in California and the Southwest have major Mexican-American populations, such as Los Angeles, San Antonio, El Paso, Houston, Dallas, and Phoenix. Mexico continues to be the largest source of immigration to the US today, and while most Mexican-Americans are not immigrants, about 30% are, and because of this, just as German was spoken in large numbers in the US, 
in the decades following the waves of German immigration to the country. Spanish is by far the most common language in the country besides English. About 13% of Americans speak it at home, and many others are learning it as a second language. The U.S. has a large black population across the country, but due to the legacy of slavery, it's centered in the Southeast, the region commonly known as the South. Black Americans make up the largest ancestry group in the southern U.S., stretching from Arkansas to Florida to Virginia, as well as in Maryland, Delaware, and the District of Columbia, which are today often considered northeastern states, but were historically considered southern and had significant populations living in slavery before the Civil War. They were also destinations for black migrants from the south who moved north seeking jobs during the Great Migration. Black Americans additionally make up the second largest ancestry group in Texas, a state at the meeting point of the South and Southwest, which also had a significant population of people living under the horrible institution of slavery, as well as Michigan, a Midwestern state which was a major destination during the Great Migration. Many black people in the U.S. are descended from more recent immigrants from places like Africa and the Caribbean, and often identify with their particular country of ancestry. But the majority of black Americans are descendants of American slavery, whose ancestors came from a wide variety of countries and ethnic groups speaking a number of different languages. The awful and violent institution of slavery stripped enslaved people of their dignity and humanity. Many were killed and abused. But we know that most enslaved people were taken from the west coast of the continent, from Senegal to Angola. People were taken from all over Africa. And as the institution often took away people's names, languages, and family records, it's in many cases difficult for individuals to trace their ancestry back prior to slavery. Because of this, descendants of American slavery are often considered to make up a single ethnic group, with ancestors from across the continent, but shaped by a common history within the country, although different groups have been influenced by other cultures, such as the Louisiana Creoles, who we'll talk about later, or the Gullah in South Carolina and Georgia, who maintained a number of traditions and linguistic elements from Africa, and speak a language similar to those spoken in Sierra Leone. Only about 400,000 of the 12.5 million people brought in chains from Africa to the Americas were taken to the United States, but white plantation owners, primarily in rural parts of the agricultural South, would enslave millions of their descendants in the two centuries in which slavery existed in the U.S. and the 13 colonies. On the eve of abolition during the Civil War, around 4 million black Americans were enslaved, mostly in the South, as most northern states had abolished the awful practice in the previous decades. America's treatment of its black population has been among the worst parts of its history. Many dealt with horrible racism and were barred from voting, and racial segregation and discrimination were legally enshrined across much of the country, especially in the South. Sharecropping remained as an exploitative system of farm labor in much of the rural South where most black Americans lived. It, along with racial housing covenants, the racist housing practice of redlining, and widespread hiring discrimination kept many descendants of enslaved people, who often had little familial wealth due to slavery, trapped in poverty. Major progress was made during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s, where illegal segregation was toppled by a movement of mass protests, boycotts, voting drives, and marches. Many activists put their lives at great risk, and leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X were assassinated. A mass migration during and after the World Wars saw black Americans leave the South in huge numbers, fleeing discrimination, segregation, and the low wages of sharecropping, seeking jobs in the North as industrial workers left to fight in Europe while the war itself necessitated more production. Known as the Great Migration, it was one of the largest internal migrations in U.S. history. Around 6 million black Southerners left the region, and when the Great Migration ended, nearly half of the country's black residents were living outside the South only 8% had been before. Though many made their way to the fast-growing West Coast, most black Southerners moved directly north, taking trains to northern rail hubs in the Midwest and Northeast. Midwestern and Northeastern cities like Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, St. Louis, Chicago, and New York City became major destinations for migrants. Though the United States was formerly a British colony, more Americans traced their ancestry to another country conquered and colonized by the British, than to the center of British power in England itself. 10% of Americans have Irish ancestry, but in only four states are Irish Americans the most common ancestry group. Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Vermont, those immediately surrounding Boston, the main port of entry for Irish immigrants to the country. Across the rest of the country, though, Irish Americans are much more widespread. They make up the second largest ancestry group in 23 different states throughout the Northeast, Midwest, South, and West,
from Maine to Georgia to Nebraska to Oregon. Practically every state in the country has some significant population with Irish ancestry. The tactics of colonization and empire that Britain would use to conquer and devastate lands across the globe were first used on a country less than 100 miles from Britain itself. Ireland was invaded by England in 1169, and until 1922, most of the island was more or less controlled by Britain or its client states. They imported the English language, and over the centuries it overtook Gaelic, the native tongue of Ireland, as the island's most common language. In the mid-1800s, when most Irish immigration to the U.S. occurred, around 30% of Ireland spoke Gaelic, while 70% spoke English. Today, around 40% of Ireland's population can speak Gaelic, but only around 2% speak it at home. After a successful revolution in the middle of the 17th century, British ruler Oliver Cromwell ordered an invasion to retake the island, killing half of Ireland's population in the process. In the early 1600s, around the same time Britain was founding its first American colonies, it began establishing a settler colony in Ireland as well. In what was known as the Plantation of Ulster, Britain sent around 80,000 Scottish and English settlers from the border regions of Scotland and England to the northernmost Irish province, Ulster, bringing in a population that was mostly Protestant and loyal to Britain, while most Irish were Catholic and opposed British rule, planting the seeds of future conflicts in the region. Though under British rule and with a predominantly English-speaking population, relatively few Irish people immigrated to the 13 colonies in comparison to English settlers. Those that did were often very poor and worked as indentured servants to pay off the cost of the journey. And though a few colonies, which were unsurprisingly the most attractive for Irish Catholic immigrants, were founded on principles of religious freedom, many were quite religiously intolerant. By 1790, with the U.S. now independent, only around 5% of the new country's population was of Irish descent. Twice that number were what became known as Scots-Irish, descendants of the Scottish and English settlers in Ulster. Around a century after their ancestors had arrived in Ulster, many Protestants from the region decided to leave, looking for better economic opportunities and less religious conflict in the Protestant-dominated colonies. Around 250,000 left for the 13 colonies, and having grown up on a colonial frontier themselves, often chose not to stay in the port city of Philadelphia where most arrived, instead pushing inland into the Appalachians and then the south, building isolated communities in the Appalachian south and shaping much of what we think of as Appalachian culture today. Most immigration records refer to the Scots-Irish as simply Irish. Because they immigrated from Ireland and their ancestors came from both Scotland and England, they could have surnames from all three countries, and self-identification puts their descendants at about 1% of the population, but considering they made up 10% upon independence, it's likely a bit higher. Many people in the Upland South, where the Scots-Irish primarily settled, report their ancestry as American, and it's thought that many of them are descendants of Scots-Irish immigrants. Most Irish immigrants to the U.S., though, arrived between 1840 and 1930, spurred by the Great Famine, a potato blight made worse by bad British policies such as continually exporting crops off the island, which could have helped feed the population, led to over a million deaths in the country and two million refugees to flee the island which only had 8 million people to begin with. Poverty had already been a massive problem on the mostly rural island beforehand, but the famine and ensuing population exodus made the situation much worse, and throughout the next century, people continued to leave. Ireland's population would only start to grow again in the 1960s, and is still nowhere near what it was before the famine. Around 4.4 million Irish people would immigrate to the U.S. in the late 1800s and early 1900s, contributing significantly to the mass immigration wave the country was experiencing, as was a huge Irish diaspora. The US, UK, and Australia each are home to more people with Irish ancestry than Ireland's population today. Irish immigrants mostly came to port cities like Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago, as they were primarily refugees with little money who couldn't afford land for a farm. Many dealt with discrimination, often for their religion, and though many spoke English, many did not and literacy was very low. Boston in particular was the epicenter of Irish immigration, and the northeastern part of the country has the highest concentration of Irish ancestry. Though many stayed in the ports of entry, large numbers of Irish immigrants took jobs in rural parts of the country, doing hard labor such as mining, canal building, and laying railroad tracks as the country expanded west. And from there, as their economic situations improved over time, Descendants of Irish immigrants moved across much of rural America.
Americans of English descent are the fifth largest ethnic group in the country, but only the most common in three states, Maine, Utah, and Idaho. In three more states, they're the second largest group, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Wyoming. Most states, unsurprisingly, have significant numbers of people with English ancestry. Though they're reported at about 7% of the U.S. population, the number is thought to be undercounted quite a bit. There's probably a few reasons for this. First off, descendants of English colonists have never really been seen as an other in American society. They never had the immigrant experience of learning a new language or being in an unfamiliar culture. It's thought that many people who report their ancestry as just American are likely in part of English descent. Additionally, the further back you go, the less connected you might feel to the country your ancestors came from. As many Americans have both colonial as well as later immigrant ancestry, it's thought that many people skip over or are unaware of their English ancestry and solely identify with that of later immigrant groups, simply because they feel more connected to or are just more aware of their ancestors who arrived to the U.S., say, 100 as opposed to 400 years ago. Though English ancestry is likely pretty undercounted in the U.S., it's probably not by an extreme amount, as the immigration waves of the 1800s dwarfed the country's population upon independence. Though many Americans have English-sounding last names, this isn't a great metric by which to tell English ancestry because so many immigrants anglicized their last names upon arrival. Because so many English who arrived in the U.S. did so as colonists, English settlers and their descendants make up much of the early American political and social elite and continue to today. They dominated the culture and society of the young country, making up around half of the U.S. population upon independence. English has always been by far the most commonly spoken language in the country, as new immigrants were always arriving into a mostly English-speaking, though not English-descended, population. As the country spread its borders west, conquering Native American land, Americans from Britain's former 13 colonies moved with it. Many English Americans, though, are descendants of the same immigration wave that brought large numbers of people to the country from Germany, Ireland, and other European countries. From the 1850s to 1930s, around 2.5 million immigrants came to the U.S. from England. Steamships made travel fairly affordable, and jobs were opening up with the expansion of the country westward. The large proportions of people with English ancestry in the northern New England states of Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont are primarily descendants of English colonists, as those states were part of the 13 colonies, but being mountainous and lacking major cities didn't experience as much immigration as the rest of the East Coast. The high English-American population in the Mountain West states of Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming, though, are from later immigration to the country through the LDS Church. Despite starting in the U.S., the LDS Church, whose members are commonly referred to as Mormons, had more success finding new converts to the faith in England than in America. As American Mormons migrated west to Utah and neighboring states, English Mormons followed suit, with most of the country's LDS population leaving England altogether for Utah. Today, the U.S. has a significantly larger Mormon population than the U.K., and many are descended from English immigrants. The sixth largest ancestry group in the country are Italian Americans, at about 5% of the U.S. population. Similarly to Irish immigrants, the descendants of immigrants from Italy are the most common ethnic group in the states surrounding their main port of entry, in this case, New York City. They make up the largest ancestry group in New York and neighboring New Jersey and Connecticut, but unlike Irish Americans, are not as widespread across the country as the second most common ancestry group, only making up the second largest proportion of the population in nearby Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Pennsylvania, Ohio, and New Hampshire also have large Italian-American populations. Many parts of the country, such as the South and Midwest, have far fewer Italian-American residents, but in the Northeast, the country's population core, there are many people with Italian ancestry. Italy became a unified country in 1871, but unifying what had been throughout history, a number of different countries and city-states brought with it chaos and violence. While the north of the country was fairly well-off, industrialized and urbanized, southern Italy was mostly agricultural, rural, and poor. Even today, the economic divide between the north and south of the country is quite significant. For example, Milan and Naples have fairly similar populations in their metro areas, but Milan, a northern city, has a GDP per capita 3.5 times higher than that of Naples, a southern city. With high poverty and social unrest, many Italians, mostly poor farmers from the southern part of the peninsula as well as Sicily, took steamships across the Atlantic. Throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s, 13 million people left the country, 
4 million of whom went to the United States. Argentina and Brazil were also both major destinations. In Argentina in particular, two-thirds of the country has Italian ancestry. Nearly half of the Italian immigrants to the US, however, returned after just a few years. Having made some money, they went back home to their families in Italy. Had they stayed at similar rates to other immigrant groups who often bought land to farm and came with their families, the US would have a significantly larger population of Italian descent. Most worked in industrial jobs in the cities, living together in majority Italian neighborhoods. Many cities have large Little Italys today, and Italian immigrants were often the target of discrimination in their new country. New York was the main port of entry, and from there, many Italian immigrants went to nearby northeastern cities like Providence, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Newark, and Boston. Outside the Northeast, only a few pockets of the country attracted large numbers of Italian immigrants, namely Chicago, Florida, New Orleans, and California. Additionally, there are eight states where the largest, second largest, or both ancestry groups are not among the six most common nationwide. Black Americans make up the largest ancestry group in Louisiana, but the second most common ethnic group are Americans whose ancestors came from France, as a result of Louisiana's history as an important French colony with a large population and a major port city. Early Louisiana was shaped by a wide array of different cultures and peoples, with French and Spanish colonists, enslaved people from Africa, Haitian and German immigrants, American settlers, and native people all interacting in the bustling and cosmopolitan port city of New Orleans. Descendants of Louisiana's colonial population make up a multiracial ethnic group known as Louisiana Creoles, most of whom trace their ancestry to a number of different places and peoples from around the world, primarily a combination of France, Spain, West Africa, and the indigenous peoples of the region. The other main French-descended ethnic group in the state are the Cajuns, who live in a region in southwestern Louisiana called Acadiana, separated by swamps and bayous from the state's other main population centers. The origin of their name comes from their ancestors, the Acadians, descendants of French settlers to the colony of Acadia which is today split between Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec, and parts of eastern Maine. French colonists had lived in Acadia for a century and a half, developing a culture, dialect, and national identity that differed from the French colonists in what is now Quebec and Louisiana. Beginning in 1755, Britain, after taking control of the colony, deported many of the Acadians from Acadia. Many successfully hid, and today there's a large Acadian population in Maine and the Maritime Provinces. Many of those who were expelled from the colony fled to French-speaking Louisiana, where their descendants became known as Cajuns. Both Cajuns and Creoles developed unique foods, traditions, and dialects of French influenced by both their French ancestry, as well as those of other groups in the region, and shaped by their local surroundings. Around 7% of the state speaks some dialect of French, and it has by far the highest Catholic population of the heavily Protestant South. About as far from the west coast of the mainland US as the east coast is, it's no surprise that Hawaii, located in Oceania in the middle of the Pacific, has been shaped by different cultures and immigration waves in the rest of the country. In fact, not one of the four most common ancestor groups in the state are among the 10 largest groups in the country overall. Filipino Americans make up the largest group at about 24% of the population, followed by Japanese Americans at 20%, Native Hawaiians, and Chinese Americans. Just as in the rest of the US, most people in Hawaii trace their ancestry to a combination of different nations and cultures. An independent kingdom for a century, home to the Hawaiian people, a Polynesian ethnic group that today makes up around 20% of the state's population. It was overthrown by wealthy American plantation owners with the backing of the US, who eventually annexed it. They established sugar, pineapple, and coffee plantations across the island. Agriculture dominated Hawaii's industry, ushering in a century-long plantation era where farm workers were subject to exploitative labor practices, poor working conditions, mistreatment, and low wages at the hands of wealthy farming magnates. Most workers were brought in from Asia, primarily the Philippines, Japan, and China, whose descendants make up the large populations of Filipino, Japanese, and Chinese Americans in the state today. Most immigrants from the Philippines were members of an ethnic group known as the Ilocano people from the northern part of Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines, and most Chinese immigrants were speakers of the Cantonese language from Guangdong, a heavily populated region surrounding the Pearl River Delta. The state's also home to major populations of people whose ancestors immigrated there from other parts of Asia and Oceania, such as Korea, Samoa, Tonga, Okinawa, and Micronesia.
In two other states, Oklahoma and Alaska, the largest ancestry group are indigenous people, who make up 14% of the population in Oklahoma and 20% in Alaska. Across the country, the indigenous people of North America were killed by colonists and settlers, diseases like smallpox, and were throughout history pushed off their land or confined to small reservations as the U.S. expanded west, often through violent wars and unfair treaties. Many lost elements of their cultures and languages through forced assimilation in missions and later boarding schools. Despite being the original inhabitants of the country, Native Americans didn't receive U.S. citizenship until 1924, and the treatment of the country's Native people is one of the most shameful aspects of U.S. history. Of course, Indigenous Americans represent combined populations of a number of distinct ethnic groups, with different histories, languages, and traditions. With most of Alaska over a thousand miles from the rest of the U.S., the indigenous people of the state are often collectively referred to as Alaska Natives, as they have major historical and cultural differences from the native people of the contiguous U.S., who are often collectively referred to as Native Americans, which is on its own an incredibly wide grouping of hundreds of different tribes, cultures, and ethnic groups. The native people of Alaska, who were left somewhat alone compared to the native people of the lower 48, only because it was so far removed from the rest of the country and wasn't seen as particularly useful to the U.S. until oil was discovered in 1968, fall into two major linguistic and cultural groups. The first are the Inuit peoples and their related ethnic groups such as the Yupik and Aleut, who live primarily in parts of the state around Alaska's coasts, and are part of a wider grouping of peoples who live in the Arctic from Alaska through northern Canada, especially Nunavut, all the way to Greenland. The other major linguistic group are speakers of the Nadini language family, which include the Athabascan, Iyak, and Clinket peoples, who are more closely related to the Native Americans of the contiguous U.S. and First Nations people of Canada. They live primarily in the interior and panhandle of the state. Additionally, members of the Tsimshin and Haida peoples, whose languages are each part of separate language families and who mostly live in Canada, live in the very south of Alaska's panhandle. Alaska was first colonized by Russia, who took to land for fur trading. They brought with them diseases the native people of Alaska hadn't been exposed to, which, along with violence at the hands of Russian colonists, killed many of them. In particular, Russian fur traders killed and enslaved many Aleut people of the Aleutian Islands, where the Russians hunted sea otters. Many Russians also married into Alaska native families, and missionaries spread the Russian Orthodox faith. Though very few Alaskans have Russian ancestry, the Russian Orthodox Church remains popular among a number of Alaska Native peoples. Today, the Yupik in the southwest of the state and the Inupiaq in the North Slope are the largest indigenous peoples in the state, and Anchorage is the most indigenous major city in the U.S., with a higher percentage of indigenous residents, 12.4%, than any other U.S. city with more than 100,000 people. Unlike in Alaska, most of Oklahoma's large indigenous population are descendants of people whose homeland is in a different part of the country. The largest individual group is the Cherokee, followed by the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Muscogee, and Seminole. The largest tribe that originated in the state, the Comanche, are only the seventh largest tribe by population in the state overall. This is because the eastern half of the state sits on the site of the Indian Territory, the destination of a mass forced relocation of native people from the southeast westward. As colonists from Europe settled in the eastern U.S., the native people who lived there were often killed, died of disease, or forced westward. In the south, however, five tribes avoided seeing their land taken by conforming to the societal practices of the European settlers, taking on their customs of dress, adopting written languages, central governments, and even the horrible practice of slavery. While their borders were encroached upon significantly, they still maintained control of large sections of the south well into the 1800s. They were the Cherokee, who lived in the southern tip of the Appalachians between Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, and North Carolina, the Muscogee, or Creek, further south in Alabama and Georgia, the Chickasaw and Choctaw in Mississippi and Alabama, and the Seminole in Florida. As population pressures increased, however, President Andrew Jackson wanted to open up their land, not just for white settlers, but for the establishment of more slave plantations. Despite the Supreme Court ruling it unconstitutional, Jackson and his successor Martin Van Buren implemented the Indian Removal Act, forcing the five tribes out of their homelands in the south west to the Indian Territory on a brutal forced march called the Trail of Tears that was often well over a thousand miles in length. Thousands of native people and the black people they'd enslaved died on the Trail of Tears. In 2020, the Supreme Court ruled that the eastern half of Oklahoma, the former Indian Territory, remains Native American land, including most of the city of Tulsa, reinstating some of the largest Native American reservations in the country.
Along with the five tribes from the south, native people from all over North America were pushed into eastern Oklahoma. Today, there are 39 official tribes in the state, some of whose ancestors came from as far away as Canada and New Jersey. While the most indigenous major city in the country is Anchorage, numbers 2, 3, and 4 are all in Oklahoma. Tulsa, the Oklahoma City suburb of Norman, and Oklahoma City itself at 9, 8, and 6% of their populations, respectively. While nearly a third of New Mexico's population is Mexican-American, following them at 13% are those who trace their ancestry back to Spain. Very few Americans, just about 1%, claim Spanish ancestry. This is likely a huge undercount, as most Mexican-Americans probably have some degree of Spanish ancestry due to Spain's colonization of Mexico, but primarily consider themselves Mexican and not Spanish. As such, this large percentage of New Mexico's population that consider themselves Spanish-American are descendants not of later immigrants, but of Spanish colonists who settled in New Mexico in the 1500s. When the U.S. defeated Mexico in the Mexican-American War in 1848, they took control of a vast northern swath of the country that had primarily belonged to three different provinces, Coahuila y Tejas, the northeastern part of which became Texas following a brief period of revolution, independence, disputed territorial claims, and U.S. annexation which sparked the war, the vast western province of Alta California, from which several states including California were carved up, and Nuevo Mexico, the predecessor to the state of New Mexico. While each of the provinces had large indigenous populations, they were not granted American citizenship upon the U.S. taking control. Mexican citizens, however, both those with colonial Spanish ancestry and those with mestizo or both Spanish and indigenous ancestry, did become American citizens. At the same time, in California and Texas, this wasn't very many people, only a few thousand, but in New Mexico, anywhere from 40,000 to 60,000 people were descendants of Spanish colonists who'd settled there three centuries prior. Though as part of New Spain and later Mexico, much of the northern part of the country was sparsely settled, considered frontier provinces far from the population centers further south like Mexico City, rumors of gold and silver, as well as the ability of the Rio Grande to provide water for drinking and agriculture, led many settlers north along the river. The colonial capital of Santa Fe became a major population center and is one of the oldest cities in the country. With such a large Spanish and mestizo population during the colonial era, their descendants number around 300,000 today, many of whom, their ancestors having lived in the region for centuries, called themselves Nuevo Mexicanos, tying their ethnic identity to the inhabitants of colonial New Mexico. The last group I'll talk about in this video make up only about 1.5% of the US population, but are the second largest ancestry group in a cluster of three neighboring states, Norwegian Americans. They make up 14% of the population in Minnesota, 13% in South Dakota, and 25% in North Dakota. Additionally, each of these states have some of the largest Swedish populations in the country, and in some cases Danish and Finnish as well. Minnesota is 7% Swedish American, and this part of the country is generally considered the heart of Scandinavian America. Norwegians began leaving for the United States as part of the mass waves of immigration from Europe in the late 1800s. Though very little of Norway's land is suitable for agriculture, Many Norwegians were farmers, and as agricultural technology improved, they were able to produce significantly more food, and the country's population began to skyrocket. However, it didn't change the fact that most of Norway is covered in mountains and is freezing cold most of the year, not ideal agricultural conditions. By the 1850s, Norway's now much larger population, which had doubled from 700,000 to 1.4 million in the last 80 years alone, had overfished, was running out of farmland, and began to deal with famine. At the same time as Norwegian farmers were struggling, the U.S. was expanding westward, taking land away from Native Americans and opening it up to white settlers, even going so far as to give away large chunks of land for free for those who promised to farm it for at least five years. This sounded promising to rural Norwegians, and the invention of the steamship made travel across the Atlantic much easier. Most were farmers, and on top of that wanted to maintain their customs and traditions wherever they settled. Taking ships inland from the east coast, they typically disembarked in Chicago and continued northwest, thinking it would be difficult to maintain a sense of community in the city. Minnesota was at the time one of the newest states in the country, and the Dakotas a territory. Very few settlers had come to either at that point, and they had plenty of flat land for agriculture. Other settlers had already flocked to closer states in the Midwest like Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin, so it would be more difficult to establish a tight-knit Norwegian community. Because of that, Minnesota and later the Dakotas became prime destinations for Norwegian immigrants. At the time, entire towns would uproot and move to the upper Midwest, 
and in later decades, wealthier immigrants from cities like Oslo and Bergen would move to the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, drawn by the existing Norwegian community in the state. Though the states maintained a large Norwegian-speaking population well into the early 1900s, today hardly anyone speaks Norwegian there, though Norwegian immigrants have significantly impacted the culture, food, religion, and unique accents of the states. There is so much more I could have covered in this video. Asian immigration to the West Coast, for example, the large Jewish and Caribbean communities in and around New York, Arab Americans in Michigan, Cuban Americans in South Florida, or the Hmong and Somali populations in Minnesota, just to name a few. The U.S. has been shaped by so many different cultures with fascinating and important histories, and each state has its own unique history. There's only so much I can cover in this one video, but if this video interested you and you want to learn more about the history, geography, and culture of the United States, I highly recommend that you go watch my two-part regional breakdown of the U.S., as well as the U.S. Explained, my 56-part long-form series on not just every state in the country, but Washington, D.C., as well as the five territories. It's an in-depth and interesting series, and if you've made it this far in this video, it'll be right up your alley. Okay, this video has been long enough, so go check out the Discord, the merch, and thank you so, so much to all my patrons on Patreon. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you learned something new. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover the countries, cities, people, and places of the world and beyond. These videos will leave you saying, that is interesting.